Number 10, King Charles I. You can put any king down on this list, really. Uh, people weren't as kind and loving as we are now. Or, or well, less cruel, I guess. <laughs> king Charles was no different from any other. A monarch sniffing his own farts up in his castle, doing his very best to snuff out religious groups that he didn't agree with. A lot of guys were like that. It's brutal, but that's history, folks. Well, one such measure he took, I think, was so wrong, so heinous, and so criminal, and so offensive, that he should have been locked up for life. During the 1600s, this man, in an effort to curb religious views, outlawed Christmas. Yeah, that's right. Outlawed Christmas. That means no gifts, no tree, no Santa Claus, no turkey, no stuffing, no nothing. This was quickly dissolved after he was removed from office. And yes, I know Santa Claus wasn't there then, but st it's still, it's Santa Claus, it's Christmas. Can't have Christmas without Santa Claus. Number nine, William the Conqueror. You've all probably heard the name William the Conqueror. Battle of Hastings, illegitimate son of the king fighting for the throne, very violently too, I might add. However, today I want to talk about his dating skills. Look, dating can be hard. I, I, I get that. There's a lot of anxiety, especially when self-image comes into play. Ooh, I'm too fat. I hate my nose. And what are these legs? Ugh, no one's gonna like me. Everyone thinks like that. And it's always usually right before a date, too. You could be staring in the mirror, and then all of a sudden all your bruises, pimples, and blemishes seem to show up out of nowhere. It's weird how that works. Well, William was different though, he, he was more confident. He didn't have confidence issues like the rest of us. To quote a brilliant chemist, he was the one who knocks. As the story goes, he was quite fond of one lass. She was not fond of him. Classic story, really. So after trying to court her several times and failing, he decided to drag her on the ground by her hair until she said yes. Don't, don't do that, that's, that's bad. Number eight, Kangas Khan. I don't think some folks realize just how brutal this guy really was. I mean, if you've ever played the Ghost of Tsushima game on PlayStation, then you know exactly what the Mongol horde is capable of. Nasty things. The man carved out most of Asia and parts of Europe. In one battle allegedly taking the lives of one million people. And all that remained was a mountain of bones and human fat. Ooh, gross. He's been known on how not to treat a lady and reportedly liked to use his young and newest soldiers as arrow fodder by creating human shields with them. A lot of conscripts in his army were often taken from villages that he conquered. It's kind of how he kept the machine going. So either fight with me or that's picture wrap for you. What a nice guy. What a swell nice guy. Jeez. Number seven, Galizo Maria Saforza. This guy was just bad. Like, like all bad. Not like Deadpool where he does some bad stuff for good reasons, anti-hero kind of guy. This, nah, this guy's just straight bad, straight evil. In one story of the disturbed king, he had a rival's hands chopped off. No more tennis matches. He left prisoners in hanging cages and even had a priest that made a prediction about him that he didn't find all too flattering in prison with little food and water. It got to the point where the man had to eat his own refuse. So if you cross Galeazzo Maria Saforza, um, don't, don't do it. Number six, Ivan the Terrible. I'm not that familiar with Russian history before the year 1900, but there is a lot to unpack. It's not all Lenin and hammers and sickles and such. Ivan the Terrible was the first czar of Russia, and he was quite the specimen. From having struck his daughter-in-law and unlifing his son in a fit of rage, he was one nasty dude. However, I believe the story of him in St. Basil's Cathedral is more noteworthy. As the story goes, Ivan commissioned an architect to build St. Basil's Cathedral. If you've ever seen it, you know how gorgeous it is. All the Onion Palace buildings and whatnot, you know what I'm talking about. Ivan was so impressed with the architect's work that he had his eyes gouged out so that no one could ever build another structure or gaze upon another structure as magnificent as the cathedral. That's hardcore, dude. That's pretty hardcore. So if you do a bad job, he probably would have got rid of you. And if you do a good job, he'll still get rid of you. Number five, Julia Agrippina, Nero maker. Yes, making Nero should be considered a crime. But honestly, Julia Agrippina of Rome did quite a bit more than just that. And I can see where Nero got it all from. You see, Agrippina wanted to be in power. And when her uncle, Emperor Claudius, separated from his wife due to a scandal, Agrippina saw an opportunity, no matter how messed up it seems to both us and the people of the time. Agrippina seduced her uncle, became his fourth wife, and by extension, became the empress. But it doesn't stop there. 
She manipulated her uncle husband into making her son Nero heir to the throne and set up a marriage between Nero and her daughter-in-law Octavia. It's even rumored that she poisoned the food that ended her husband's life, allowing Nero to rise to power, which really bit her in the butt when Nero had her assassinated. What is this crazy family? Good God. Number four, Queen Theodora. Queen Theodora was scandalous before she even became queen. She was involved in theater from a young age, and one of her most well-known character portrayals involved her stripping down to next to nothingness. But her acting career slowed right down when she met and married Justinian I, who was the heir to the throne of the Byzantine Empire. The two of them were as thick as thieves and ruled together, but that doesn't mean she didn't have a knack for her dispatching of those who threatened her position. She was scandalous, but she did way more good than she did bad. She set up houses for ladies of the night, worked for women's marriage and dowry rights, and banished brothel keepers from the Byzantine Empire. She was also a huge supporter of monophysitism. I hope I said that right. She's even considered a saint in the Eastern Orthodox Church of the modern day. Killing it, Theo. That's kind of a bad joke, actually. Number three, the great she-wolf of France. Queen Isabella of France started off her queen life married to Edward II of England, who preferred the company of men to his own wife. This is obviously a precarious and possibly extremely frustrating situation to find oneself in, but she kept it bottled up and even gave birth to a son, Edward III, until it all came to a head when her husband found a new favorite. She visited France and had an affair with Lord Roger Mortimer an exile from England. But the better twist came when Isabella, alongside Mortimer and a mercenary army, invaded England, took the throne, and she became queen regent for her son, Edward III, until he came into power. She also was probably responsible for the dispatching of her husband, Edward II, while he was captured. Eventually, her son would come into power, and she was imprisoned for two years before being allowed to live a quieter life in retirement. Number two. Queen Fredegund. I was constantly double taking almost the entire time I was reading about this woman. She was crazy ruthless and all seemingly for the betterment of both her bloodline and the Merovingian kingdom. She became queen in the 5th century, marrying King Chilperic and organizing the death of Queen Galswintha and sending Queen Odovera to a convent. When Brunhild, a big enemy for the king and sister of the late queen, swore vengeance on them, Fredegund brutally destroyed Brynhild's husband and sisters, destroying them as in that kind of thing. The queen also made sure that all of the other heirs to the throne stopped breathing, making it a sure thing that her bloodline would occupy the Merovingian throne. Her son, Clotar II, was only a baby when the king met his end in 587. So, of course, this ambitious queen rose up to power, fighting battles, quelling rebellions, and ensuring the smooth running of the Merovingian kingdom in her role as queen regent. She met her end in 597, 10 years after her husband, but Clotar II continued in his mom's footsteps, having Brunhild and all her descendants removed from existence, resulting in 20 years of peace. So it's good. Number one, Cleopatra. A list of scandalous queens would not be complete without one of the most well-known and famous rulers in history. Cleopatra VII, Philopater, was the last pharaoh Egypt ever had, reigning from 51 to 30 BC. Her life was full of scandal. When she first came into power, she was co-ruler with her husband and brother, Ptolemy XIII. But that didn't last very long as the two did not see eye to eye and it started a huge civil war in the country. At the same time, a conflict from Rome made its way to Egypt as well, resulting in Julius Caesar allegedly being seduced by Cleopatra and helping her end her brother's life. And again, being co-ruler with another of her brothers, also named Ptolemy, and ending the life of one of her sisters. She was also having an affair with Caesar and even produced a son with him, who became co-ruler with her after Caesar's death and after her other brother was seemingly assassinated. I'm so glad I was not a part of these families. Just death and betrayal everywhere. She then went on to seduce second Roman triumvirate member Mark Anthony and sided with him when Octavian and Mark Anthony engaged in the final war of the Roman Republic, 
which Anthony lost, fighting with and alongside him until she poisoned herself to avoid being paraded through Rome and executed by the victorious Octavian. In our number 10 spot, we have Irene of Athens. Starting off this list today, we are heading back to the Byzantine Empire. Irene of Athens was the mother of Constantine VI, and while the pair co ruled together for almost two decades, things ended in quite the tragedy. After the pair co ruled, Irene did go on to rule on her own from 797 to 802 CE, but you might be wondering how she managed to outrule her son. Well, Irene, the ambitious ruler, wanted full control all to herself. Herself, so she asked for the help of some political allies to pull off a scheme against her own son. She began to lead a conspiracy against him to try and get him out of power. The duo did end up reconciling their relationship, but this is not where the story ends. In 786, the public began to turn their backs on Constantine because he had decided to divorce his wife and instead marry his mistress. Irene saw this as a second chance and once again chose to conspire against her own son. Honestly, fool me once shame on you. Fool me twice, this lady did not care. Here's where things in the story get exceptionally gory. Irene not only ordered the arrest of her son, but also ordered that his eyes be gouged out. Yep. That's how good old Mumsy came into power. In our number 9 spot today, we have Elizabeth Bathory. Elizabeth was a Hungarian noblewoman who lived from August of 1560 to August of 1614. She was born into one of the oldest and most powerful families in Transylvania, and she was well educated and ran various estates and bore many children. Oh, and this is all happening while she was also killing young women and bathing in their blood. Yeah. Weird, gross, terrible. Elizabeth is known for killing her servants and bathing in their blood as she believed it would keep her young. Guess no one told her about moisturizing and minding your own business. All accounts of Elizabeth remember her as a terrible, evil person. It is said that her number of victims most likely ranges somewhere from 175 to 200, but some claim it might be as many as 600 people. It is no wonder she is referred to as Countess Dracula. In our number 8 spot today, we have Olga of Kiev. Olga of Kiev became queen regent in 945 CE after her husband was killed, and during the time her son was just too young to rule. Olga knew that once her son was old enough to be crowned king, her power would be taken away, so she needed to see her wishes carried out before that happened. Her wishes included the capturing and killing of those who took the life of her husband, which was carried out using scalding hot water. Yeah, don't even want to imagine what that would have been like. Don't kill the king, I guess. Historically, it doesn't seem to work out well. Apparently, in doing this, however, Olga developed a bit of a bloodthirst, and she would not rest until everyone associated with the people who killed her husband were all eliminated. She is the ultimate ride or die. It seems like if you even looked in the wrong direction or breathed in the vicinity of someone who had something to do with the king's slaying, you could kiss your own life goodbye. Olga took hundreds of people out of the tribe that the killers were from, she devised a plan to bury the tribe leaders alive, and she even came up with a plan to set fire to their entire village. It is said that Olga may have locked the tribe's leaders in a bathhouse and burned it down, but we don't know for sure. All we do know is that she was not okay. In our number 7 spot today, we have Wu Zetian. Throughout the long and storied history of China, there has only ever been one woman who held supreme power, and that is Empress Wu Zetian. Of course, considering this historic feat, she wanted to ensure that she kept her power by any means necessary. She had all of her rivals killed, so anyone who could possibly overthrow her or come for her seat on the throne was eliminated. The Empress ordered the execution of the previous Empress, as well as members of her own family. She had multiple methods of taking these people out, and rumor has it that she even had her own grandmother and two of her grandchildren killed for going against her. It didn't matter who you were, if you threatened her power, you are done for. It is said that after a while, the Empress decided to do a little less killy killy and a little more lovey lovey. Yeah. Apparently, she started spending more time with her lovers using some aphrodisiacs. You know, we all are a little crazy when we're young, but as we get older, we all crave the simplicity and just someone to love. Right? Of course, though. 
the people don't forget, and they were sure to exact their revenge. The people fought back and ended up having all of her lovers killed, and the empress herself was exiled. You know what they say about karma? She does not miss. In our number 6 spot today we have Mary the First. Queen Mary the First didn't get the nickname Bloody Mary from nowhere. Oh no, this name was certainly earned. Mary was a Catholic queen in a Protestant country, which as you can imagine was quite problematic when she ascended the throne of England in 1553. Although her reign only lasted 5 years, she made a mark on history in a multitude of ways. She was the first true queen of England, and she was quite a vicious ruler. During her time as queen, Mary announced a war against Protestantism, which left many who belonged to the religion being charged with hearsay. Doesn't sound all that bad until you learn that at the time, the usual sentence for hearsay was to be burned at the stake. Nice. Mary was responsible for the burning of over 300 Protestants during her time as queen, which unsurprisingly left her quite unpopular. Number 5. Tamiris Honestly, every time I face her in Civilization 6, it just ends badly. I'll spend a few turns building my economy or maybe organizing some troops, and I look back over at her cities and she's already amassed a massive army and is ahead in science. Yeah, I'm not the best Civ 6 player, but sheesh lady, come on, give me a break. This probably has something to do with her real life counterpart. Tamiris was a woman who lost her son to Cyrus the Great. So she said to herself, I don't know what's so great about the Cyrus guy. There's a trailer park voice reference in there somewhere. Just imagine Ricky telling Cyrus off. I don't know, you, you gotta find it. Basically, after losing her son, she gathered the troops and commenced battle. The almighty Cyrus met his end, which, given how the way women were treated back then, probably didn't go over too well with PR. Yeah, she got her revenge though. Number four, the Trung sisters. The Trung sisters are double trouble. You're getting two queens at once here. China was being down bad and trying to conquer some things that maybe they shouldn't have. Naughty, no. The Trung sisters came to answer the call. These girls are actually revered as heroes still today in Vietnam. But what they were able to do for so long was very impressive. China had a very impressive army, no surprise there, and Vietnam was a much smaller country, or kingdom I guess you'd say, and their army was not as impressive. But the sisters managed to hold them off for three years. Three years with their forces. That, that is crazy good. That is very impressive and perhaps a lot of bloodshed too. Sadly, the sisters waded off into the waters before they could be captured, because after that long fighting, I wouldn't want to be captured either. Number three, Grace O'Malley. Have I see land lovers? Ye be looking for Grace O'Malley. Well, then ye come to the right place, sir. Thank you, thank you. That is my private impression. I will be here all week. Bad impressions aside, Grace O'Malley wasn't a traditional queen to be fair, but what she didn't have in regular queen qualities, she did make up for that in being a badass pirate. Nice. This is another one where I'm gonna ask Hollywood for a movie, please. Irish Pirate Queen? Come on guys, that's just a movie begging to be made. Grace O'Malley was a fierce pirate from the age of 11 and a wise woman who ruled the seas after her father's passing. I don't really have much to say after that to be honest. I'll just wait for Hollywood to make their move. And maybe you can cast me in there. And I can put on some long red hair and some boots and I could I could swim and just put the red hair on me right now. I just look so good. <laughs> Number two, Queen Victoria. Okay, hear me out on this one. This one has more to do with their lineage, per se, than her, but it's her somewhat to blame. Okay, so Tsar Nicholas II of Russia, King George V of Britain, and Wilhelm Kaiser II of Germany were all first cousins. Their grandma was Queen Victoria. What? I, I know, right? Isn't that, isn't that weird? Yeah, it's weird. Imagine how crazy your bloodline has to be for that. And, you know, the fact that during World War I, all three of these cousins were at war with each other. I mean, that, that's just insane. I mean, families fight, sure, but come on, man. Get the mustard gas off the table, bro. Come on. That's cheap. Just don't. Number one, my mom. My mom, I love her so much. She, she's the best. But man, sometimes, oh, she's so unfair. I had to do chores when I was a kid, and I had to put down the toilet seat, and worst of all, she made me put the little toothpaste back in the tube when I was done with it. Ugh, I mean, come on, right? Not like she ever did anything for me, like birth me, feed me, raise me, clothe me, and love me unconditionally, and now I gotta make my bed? Oh, this is the worst day ever! I'm sure no other cute boy with blue eyes like me ever had this problem. Ugh! Number 10. What a drag. Bachelor number one, 
What would you do if I refused to marry you? Well, I would probably get quite violent and lead to the destruction of 10,000 lives at the Battle of Hastings. Might just drag you around by your hair and see where the night goes. William I, or more appropriate, William the Conqueror, was a fierce warrior and the first Norman King of England. Being the illegitimate child he was to the throne, some people didn't exactly respect the power moves old Willie was making. People rebelled, and he crushed them. Oh, and there was this one time that he fancied a woman named Matilda. Being the respected woman that she was, she declined Willie's advances. Willie, not taking no for an answer, promptly dragged her around by the hair until she agreed to marry him. Gee, what a, what a swell guy. Number 9. Let them eat cake. France had seen better days in the 1790s. People were starving, the economy was bust, and for some reason the poor citizens were being taxed the most. When cries were made from the people, they demanded that change be made. King Louis XVI being the great leader he was, he listened to the people and there was no problem ever again. Oh wait, he did nothing and the country had a bloody revolution. The man supposed to be leading his people failed to act. In fact, he did less than nothing, often trying to silence the riots by force. But when people are very hungry, and you're living fat with high society, you can lose your head in all that chaos. While the famous quote, let them eat cake, may not have actually been said, it's a good reminder of the disconnect between the upper class and poor. Leaving your people to starve isn't the best idea if you want to be a king for a long time. Number 8. Cash back. King George III had a simple ask of the American colonies. Right then, we just saved you all from the French and Indians, so now it's time to do the right thing and pick up the bill. Britain introduced new taxes on the colonies in order to pay back what it had spent on the previous war. But in reality, he was asking the colonies to pay up without much in return. Basically, I'm the king, I saved your skins, give me more money. Which most people at the time couldn't afford. And I'm still going to boss you around. The British Empire may have been victorious, but it was the colonists who felt all the effects of the war and the economy. This happened multiple times before some patriots had had enough and decided to act. And what he did when the people he was forcing to give money spilt a little tea? Well, he sent British troops for a semi-friendly military occupation. I hate to loan this guy a nickel. Number 7. Terrible Ivan He wasn't called Ivan the very friendly and generous and would for sure never cause any harm to anyone ever. He was Ivan the Terrible, and for good reason. His actions are very unholy. Let's start with the fact that he killed his son's pregnant wife. And when his son came to confront dear old dad, his son was struck with a pointed staff, killing him in a fit of rage. A legend tells us that once St. Basil's Cathedral was finished construction, he was so pleased with the architect to reward him for such magnificent work, Ivan gouged his eyes out so that no one would ever design something so beautiful again. His paranoia also caused the slaughter of Novgorod, where after he was done claiming thousands of lives, he burned all the fields just for good measure. Wouldn't want all those dead people farming without your permission. Should we tell them about the other world monuments? Number 6. Off with her head! Henry VIII is more well known for how he treated his wives more than his leadership. With a reign of over 20 years, the man had a few wives. Two of his wives were executed for ridiculous reasons, another was divorced. Turns out, actually, the church wouldn't grant that divorce he was looking for. So Henry went and did the next best thing. He broke away from the Catholic Church and dissolved the monasteries, taking their wealth and redistributing it as he saw fit. Nothing is unholier than trying to get away from the church. Historians believe that his divorce actually led to the English Reformation. Number 5. Rebel Princess Princess Leia wasn't the only rebel, okay? Princess Margaret partied with rock stars during the 60s. The Queen's younger sister was known as the Rebel Princess. She was seen for years and years as this, well, bad. She passed away in 2002, but even to this day, we're trying to piece together her love life. Pablo Picasso actually wanted to marry her at one point. How fun is that? Also, side note, I didn't realize how recent Pablo Picasso died. That was alarming to find out. Guess my whole life's a lie. Her wedding was the first to be aired on TV. That's quite a big deal. The first televised royal wedding took place on May 6, 1960. In 1968, just eight years after, word had spread that the princess had an affair at a nightclub with pianist Robin Douglas Holm, who only a year and a half later took his own life. Adds a lot of mystery there. Then come 1973, the paparazzi got photos of her with a landscape gardener on her private island. One of the more unusual facts surrounding Princess Margaret was that she was cremated, believe it or not. She had chosen to break tradition so that her ashes could be shared in the same tomb as her father. How sweet is that? These acts are unusual when it comes to royalty, but Margaret also supported more than 80 charity organizations. But even then, media still focused on her love life. Classic. Keep it up. 
At number four, Warrior Queen. Let's talk about Queen Rainy Lakshmi Bai and how she became known as India's Joan of Arc. Rainy was a fighter her whole life. She was raised to be a warrior and was taught how to fight. She even shared her skills with other women, teaching them the same fighting skills at a young age. She was married off to a much older man and she had a child, but she lost them both pretty early on. In need of an heir, she adopted a son and served as queen regent, but soon a growing conflict started causing a lot of tension between the British East Indian Company and her people. The young queen, at just 22 years old, wanted to drive British forces out of her land, and so she organized a revolt that turned bloody very quickly. She ordered the execution of literally every British person in the region. So Bobby from down the street, dead. Mary from around the block, goner. Freddie and Harriet, the kids of that guy that you know who bought shoes off your brother, bye bye. Gone. Rainy killed every man, woman, and child in the area. But it still wasn't enough to win against the British. The Queen died on the battlefield, and the British ended up winning the battle, and the kingdom fell to the enemy forces. This Queen was one of the bravest and most determined women in history, and she's still remembered as a hero. Number three, Chelonis. The reason we look at princesses like Margaret and say she was a rebel is because most of the time these marriages are chosen. Well, rather, women are forced to marry some gross fat dudes. And while he's cheating and eating lobster, the wife has to have his kids and be dutiful. So for the Spartan princess from the 3rd century, she too was forced to marry Cleonymus, this older, horrible man. He was so horrible that he wasn't even allowed to have his father's throne. That's how bad he was. He was in the family and still they're like, no. So Chelones thought, this guy sucks, the system sucks, I'm gonna go talk to the much more pleasant Archytatus, son of King Eris the first. Around 272 BC, both these guys, both her lovers, went to war with each other. Mm, drama. How about the T on that? Chelonis was preparing to hang herself in case her husband won. That's horrible. Now, luckily, he lost, therefore the princess this time around did really live happily ever after with her other man. That's like an R-rated version of Shrek 2, what I just said. I can't believe people had to go through this in real life. That's horrible. At number two, toxic cosmetics. The price of beauty is pretty steep. These days, people spend hundreds and hundreds of dollars on makeup to make themselves feel beautiful. But back in the day, makeup not only cost a pretty penny, but it also cost some serious health concerns. Cosmetics were made of a lot of questionable ingredients that you probably wouldn't find in today's products, but for people like Queen Elizabeth I, she didn't care what she was putting on her skin, so long as she not only looked like a snack, but the whole damn meal. Yeah. Elizabeth had pitting in her skin from when she contracted smallpox at the age of 29, and back then, having blemished skin was a sign that God was a little cheesed with you, or that you were having some wild thoughts like thinking about the sexy time uwu. It was thought that these thoughts bubbled up from your no-no square up to your face and showed everyone that you were sinning. Anyways, to cover up the blemishes, Elizabeth wore a lot of makeup, like her version of foundation, but the ingredients were really just making things worse and not better. The foundation was made with a tincture of white lead ore, vinegar, and sometimes arsenic, hydroxide, and carbonate. To add some color back to her face after applying this pasty white mask, she powdered cinnabar to her lips and cheeks, but this was pretty dangerous because it contained mercury. She did this every day, and as you can imagine, it wasn't good for her health at all. Imagine absorbing all of those chemicals through your face on a daily basis. Not cute. And finally, number one. Are you not entertained? Back in the late 1800s, the name Clara Ward would stir up a conversation. She was famous, really famous, for all the wrong reasons, of course. All it took was her bumping into a European royal and Bob's your uncle. Since birth, Clara was born into money. She didn't even need a royal husband. She was born into a wealthy industrialist family. She would sometimes visit the family mills, you know, to make it look good and kind of be like, hey, how's everyone doing? Whatever, just casual visit. But on this one casual visit, she crossed paths with the Prince of Caraman Chimay. He was there for trade, but when he left, he brought back a wife. Carry on, also, meet my wife. Here she is. People were freaking out, obviously. A royal marrying a common American girl. Wow, how could you? She was the talk of the town. Unlike Meghan Markle, Clara loved to show off with her newfound wealth. Some loved her and her image, but others not so much. The marriage only lasted six years. Clara eloped with a Hungarian musician. Then after her divorce, she had to model to make a living rather than showing off for clout. 